Good evening, afternoon, early evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Sydney Yeager, and I'm the Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I am so pleased to welcome you to uh, Comparing the Jewish and Islamic Legal Traditions. Here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust, we are dedicated to our mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs are meant to illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate, bigotry, and anti-Semitism through time, and stories of resistance against injustice, and many more. Um, thank you so much for joining us today virtually. And we hope that if you're able to, you will visit the museum in person to see our current exhibitions, including Courage to Act, Rescue in Denmark, which is the museum's first exhibition for visitors ages nine and up. Uh, you can learn more and get tickets on our website. Uh, closed captions are available on today's program. Instructions on how to turn captions on or off are posted in the chat. If you have questions for our speaker during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box and we will get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. Um, today we will be discussing the comparative features of Jewish and Islamic law. We are so pleased and honored um, to be here with Professor Rabia ben Halim, who will be talking to us about the historic relationship between the Jewish and Islamic legal traditions and how they both have developed through time. Um, as a historical institution, we will be looking at this topic through a historic and American lens, and we ask that your questions do so as well. Um, so to introduce you to our uh, very amazing speaker and um, all of her amazing work, um, uh, Professor Ben Halim is an associate professor at the University of Colorado Law School. Prior to joining the Colorado faculty, she was the 2017 to 2019 William H. Hasty Fellow at the University of Wisconsin Law School. She teaches a variety of law courses, including contracts, secure transactions, Jewish law, and Islamic law. Her research focuses on two areas of inquiry, the development of Islamic and Jewish law in the modern era, and the application of Islamic law in commercial contexts. Within these areas, her current work investigates how secular environments affect interpretations and development of religious law, especially for minority religions. Professor Ben Halim's prior work experience as a lawyer and policy expert includes positions at the Brookings Institution, Meyer Brown LLP, Maersk Oil, and the Carter Center. She holds a JD from the University of Texas, an LLM from the University of Wisconsin Law School, a Master of Islamic Studies from the University of Texas, a Master of Public Policy degree from the University of Michigan, and a BA from the University of Texas at Dallas. Woo! Wow, very impressive. Um, so thank you so much for all of you for joining us today. And um, now it is my honor to hand things over to Professor Beth Hoyne. Hi, I'm so delighted to be here with you. First of all, I just wanna say a big thank you to Sydney and the museum um, for all the efforts in inviting me and coordinating it. And for all of you that signed up for day, today, really, really glad to be here with you. So I'm gonna start by sharing my PowerPoint. Sydney, I want to make sure. I think that's the right version. Sometimes we're all good. Yep, I can Great. see. I just want to make sure you didn't get presenter view. Yep. So hopefully you all know why you're here. Um, the discussion today should, is really going to be focused on really comparing the Jewish and Islamic legal traditions, which is my great passion in life. It's what I spend a lot of time thinking about. So first of all, like, why do this comparative project? Uh, and for me, there's several different reasons. So first, when we look at the history of Jewish and Muslim interaction, what we see is a really long and rich history of Jewish and Muslim scholars interacting with each other and influencing each other in the ways in which they think about religious law and how it should be understood. Likewise, I have these questions of how does religious law maintain relevancy when circumstances have changed. And so, for instance, with Muslims living in the United States today, it's one of the first instances that Muslims have lived in a minority context, while as of course, the Jewish diaspora has had a very long experience with that. And I think there's something to be said for that interaction and being able to learn from each other as American Jews and American Muslims. Additionally, um, there's this question I have of what does it mean to live as a religious minority or as a religious majority? And what does it mean for the state to be involved um, in the ways in which religious law is understood or for the state not to be involved, for there not to be police power? And so I do a lot of research on that as well. So why do this comparative project? Well, 
I really view it as the continuation of a tradition. So Muslims and Jews had very, very long histories of interacting with each other. When we look at different parts of the world, as recently as 1950, for example, 30%, over a third of Iraq was Jewish. And so the main population that folks were interacting with um, in terms of Muslims were other Jews. And we see this going back um, all throughout the Ottoman Empire and earlier, we see it in Andalusia. So we have these long traditions and there was a real deepening of knowledge, I think, that happened through this comparison and dialogue. So a deepening of knowledge of one's own religious tradition and understanding it in comparison to a similar but different religious tradition. And those similarities are in part structural. So the ways in which Muslim and Jewish scholars are trying to understand the divine and what the divine wants of them ends up with really similar structural similarities. And it's not just that there's sort of these structural similarities, but also Muslims and Jews um, were influential upon each other, that there was a relationship that was happening in the ways in which interpretation was happening, when there was conversations, um, when there was deep and rich dialogue, well, one might take an inspiration um, of a concept and then be able to apply it in new ways within one's own religious tradition. So what are some of those structural similarities? Um, Judith Wegener, at least, argues that the four roots of Islamic and Talmudic jurisprudence have a lot of striking similarities. So to what extent um, they were the result of conversations, it's hard to say. It may have been lost to history, but in the very least, we do see these structural similarities, both linguistically and also in terms of the concept of their counterparts. And she lists out these, and this is the, the article that it comes, this is an article that cites the Judith Wegener piece. Um, these has these sort of four roots in their counterparts. So from an Islamic um, point of view, right, there's the Quran, the what Muslims believe to be the word of God, and it is referred to as Al-Kitab. And we then have the Torah and the Jewish tradition, right, Hakatub. Right there, you can sort of, I think even if you even if you don't know Hebrew or you don't know Arabic, you can kind of see that similarity, the um, A-L and the H. A referencing, making it the definitive, and then you can see that K, T, B, both referencing sort of meaning the book. Then we have the Sunnah. The Sunnah and the Hebrew, um, Hebrew Sinin stem from a common Semitic root, and the Sunnah, conceptually at least, is really similar to the Mishnah, right? It is a oral, the recording of an oral tradition, which helps us then understand these written texts. Then there is Ijma, and at least Wagner um, argues that it is similar to the consensus of Torah scholars in Halakha. And then finally, in terms of the tools that might be used within legal interpretation, there is Qiyas within Islamic law, which is really similar to the way in which analogy uh, is used within Jewish law, right? We see analogy happening a lot throughout the Talmud. And so part of at least the argument on Qiyas is, and this is Again, debated among scholars, so just want to be upfront that a lot of this is up for debate, uh, but at least this idea of analogy being used in legal reasoning, one of the arguments that is made is that this emerged out of um, an area in early Islamic history where there was a very large Jewish population and that there at least was some evidence of conversations that were happening. And so maybe sort of this idea of like, oh, right, we can use analogy to expand and understand the law. Likewise, uh, the Quran itself really puts this injunction on understanding the Torah. I, I would argue that it's actually pretty hard. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to read the Quran, uh, but it's actually pretty hard to understand it if you don't have at least a basic working knowledge of Torah, uh, because there's all these references when you um, read the Quran of remember when Moses did such and such and remember when Abraham did such and such. And you can't really do that remembering if you don't have at least some familiarity with the stories of the Torah. And so this is a direct um, translation from a verse in the Quran, which says, we indeed sent down, indeed, we sent down the Torah in which was a guidance and light. The prophets who submitted to God judged by it for the Jews, as did the rabbis and scholars by with which they were entrusted of the scripture of God, and they were witnesses thereto. So do not fear the people, but fear me, and do not exchange my verses for a small price. And whoever does not judge by what God has revealed, then it is those who are the disbelievers. 
So what we see happening in this verse is a reference to earlier revelation, which is a pretty critical um, belief within the Islamic tradition that there was earlier revelations, earlier prophets who were rightly guided by God. And so the Torah is named here, right? It's something that was sent down by God, which has guidance and which has light. And that the ways in which we need to judge, the ways in which law needs to be developed is through God's revelation, through the words of God. This is what the believers do, right? Through the scripture of God. Um, and that this is the work of historically within the Jewish tradition, rabbis and scholars, and likewise for within the Islamic tradition, it is the work of scholars to understand, to create judgment um, by what God's revelation says. Okay. Uh, like I said, likewise, there is this historical influence on each other. So um, one of the reasons I do this work is that we find that it's actually pretty rare today. So there's not that many conversations that are happening between Muslim and Jewish legal scholars. I'm part of a group um, that meets about once every two years where we hold a symposium and workshops where we do this. And there's about oh, maybe 20 of us. Um, so, you know, there, there is a group of us at least doing this in the United States today. But this wasn't the case historically. Uh, and I think that this dialogue that Muslim and Jewish scholars had had a really lasting impact on both systems. When we look, for instance, at early Islamic law, we certainly see some influence from halakhic norms. So, for instance, um, early Islamic law was developed with halakha and the rules of halakha in mind. And many of the rules of halakha were presumed to still broadly apply unless they were abrogated by the Quran and Sunnah. And so there's a whole bunch of different things that come up uh, that sometimes people go, wait, where, where are they getting that from? And it goes, oh, well, it's actually coming from halakha. Likewise, because of this, these verses in the Quran that I just showed you, um, early Muslims studied the Talmud. And it was part of their understanding of the Quran and part of the development of Islamic law was that early Muslims actually often sat with Talmud scholars to better understand um, what, what Islamic law needed to develop, what it needed to understand in terms of Muslims' understanding of new revelation having come down. Okay, we believe that new revelation has come down. How are we supposed to interpret it? What are the tools and methodologies for interpretation? Additionally, there was early Jewish converts to Islam who were uh, definitively influential. So uh, many Jewish converts' um, stories entered Islamic hagiography, and two in particular I'll, I'll talk about today really stood out. Kab al-Akhbar was a Yemenite Jew, um, and he um, is known to have been one of the closest advisors um, to the Caliph Omar, and a lot of the early interactions um, with Jewish communities are understood to have been influenced by him. And then there was another convert. It's unclear if he was himself a convert or the son of a Jewish convert. Um, Wahib ibn Munahib um, wrote, or at least he was contributed to the works of Qisas al-Anbi'a. So Qisas al-Anbi'a is the tales of the prophets. So the you know, all of the various Torah prophets um, and their stories were captured in this book called Qisas al-Anbi'a. Um, and it recounts really a broad, wide range of things um, of Jewish biblical legends. And then sometimes they were sort of recast in an Islamic guise. Uh, but this was a work that was that is still well referenced today. And I've put some of the references of where this information comes from onto the, onto the slides. Um, and then the two religions are close in terms, like, and so this is sort of intertwining. So I gave you an example of Islamic terms with their really close corollaries within Jewish law, but we see that this went both directions. So the intertwining um, was such that a 10th century rabbinic leader, Sadia Gaon, would sort of unselfconsciously in his writings, you can, you can pull these writings, um, would refer to Jewish law. So we would refer to halakha as sharia um, and to the prayer leader in a synagogue as an imam and the direction of prayer for Jews to face as qibla, which is the um, Islamic term. And it seems like part of this is just linguistic, right? Um, that this rabbinic leader was existing in a context where Arabic was the um, most commonly spoken language. And so these terms of sharia being used interchangeably for halakha, so almost as a stand-in, right? For, okay, like the religious law we follow. 
um, for imam in terms of linguistic is oh yeah the, the person who's the prayer leader the direction of prayer again uh, that there was a close interaction culturally. And then, of course, I could not have this conversation uh, without talking about the Rambam. So, uh, right, so we know that Maimonides, the guide for the perplexed, um, is really a restatement of that symbiotic relationship of Jewish and Muslim scholars, and not just legal scholars, but also spiritual masters of the time. And they think that this period of time is perhaps the, uh, I think a lot of people refer to it as sort of a golden era of, of Jewish-Muslim relationships. I think for Jews and Muslims to live just generally um, in, in spaces where they were uh, not uh, accosted, right? We know that, that after this, uh, we end up with the Spanish Inquisition, which is not great for either group. Um, but this time before is really, it's quite a special time in terms of the dialogue that is happening and the influence that Muslims and Jews are having on each other. Um, it was also written in Arabic and it was also studied by Muslim scholars. So we know the Guide for the Perplexed um, was in, at least in part inspired by these conversations, but that also Muslim scholars were also um, looking at this work and, and contemplating it. Uh, it was developed and introduced Islamic thoughts into Jewish legal and spiritual thought. So it was um, in large part, not large part, it was at least in part a reaction to sort of some of the foremost uh, developments in Islamic law at the time. And so, for instance, the guide for the perplexed is built on the Islamic notion from Sufi masters. So looking at those spiritual masters, that the ideal state is to recognize that the more one gains knowledge of God, the more one recognizes one's own ignorance. And I know that this is definitely a feeling that I um, often have, right? The more knowledge we gain, the more we realize how much more there is to know about God. And so this is certainly a time, likewise, the Ramban's, pardon me, son um, was also heavily influential in, in Cairo um, in, the, in the continued sort of dialogues that were existing. So, how what are some other sort of similarities? Well, there's these large objectives that halakha and the sharia are trying to accomplish. They're ultimately paths to God, right? Paths to reaching nearness to God. And uh, when we look at them linguistically, they're actually really similar in terms of being paths. Uh, but then ultimately, it's a human endeavor to walk this path. And that the human endeavor is imperfect. It's diverse. Every single human is unique. And it can also be in flux, that it is trying to walk the path um, to God, but throughout time and throughout the changes of time. And one of my favorite aspects of this is this question of negotiating with God. And there's these two beautiful examples from both traditions um, that involve Moses. And Moses is one of my one of my favorite characters in both. Uh, so we have, we have this text from Exodus, which I imagine many of you are familiar with, right? And, and God says to Moses, I have seen these people. They are stiff-necked, right? Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. So we have the wrath of God being incurred here. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom Ishmael, to whom you swore of your by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give you your descendants all this land, I promise them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented. So this is my favorite part, right? And did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. So what I love about this is that, that you, is, I, mean, I can't imagine being in dialogue with God, uh, much less being in dialogue uh, directly with God and then challenging um, what God has said. But we see this in Moses, that he is willing to go, hang on a second. Like, let's remember that these are people, um, that, that there's been promised things that we, right? They will be the descendants. Um, and, and then we see that God does in fact relent, 
And so that this isn't just a sort of fruitless dialogue, but is in fact fruitful and that Moses understands the ways to have dialogue and negotiate with God. And so we see um, some a similar uh, sort of dialogue within the Islamic tradition that involves both the Prophet Muhammad and Moses. And this was covered actually in the LA Times um, a few years ago. And so this is sort of story, this narrative that this is when the um, part of the night journey of the Prophet Muhammad, which Muslims believe that the Prophet Muhammad ascended um, to heaven and then came back uh, and came back with pieces of law. And so um, during this night journey, God tells the Prophet Muhammad that he and his followers should pray 50 times a day. Right? And after the conversation, and the Prophet Muhammad, as he's going through heaven, meets the other prophets. And so one of the prophets he has met is Moses. And um, after the conversation is over, Muhammad is going back down through heaven, and he meets Moses on the way down. And Moses asks him, like, how, how did the conversation with God go? Right? And if you know this story from Exodus, you can see why Moses might have been concerned. And so Muhammad, right, the Prophet Muhammad tells him about the 50 prayers. Moses is like, right, because Moses has also dealt with people and how good or not so good they are around following rules, like golden calves, um, right? And so he says, look, 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 like they are never going to be able to pray 50 times a day. Go back and request God to reduce the number. Because again, Moses has this history of negotiating with God. So the Prophet Muhammad goes back. And God reduces the number to 40, goes back down again, again runs into Moses. Moses says, okay, what did God say? And the prophet Muhammad says, uh, 40 prayers a day. And then Moses says, no, no, go back. Like your people won't be able to comply. Mine couldn't, yours won't. So the prophet Muhammad goes back and there's this back and forth going from 30, then down to 20, then down to 10, then finally five prayers. What I love about this too is the part of this narrative of Moses being like, look, I dealt with people. I'm telling you, my people couldn't do it. Your people aren't going to be able to do it. Uh, and so then Prophet Moses asks him again, what did God say? And Prophet Muhammad says five prayers a day. Moses is like, go back. Even five is going to be too much. And the Prophet Muhammad at this point says like, I can't go back. God said that was his final number and I'm too embarrassed to go back again. So five it was and five it has remained. Um, part of what I, I love a lot of different aspects of this story, but part of what I love is um, that, that it's Moses advising from his own experience. So advising from his own experience um, of dealing with people and trying to guide people onto the path of God, and also his own experience with God and what God's expectations are and negotiating it. And I think that um, it reflects in both of the legal traditions then this sort of, okay, well, both halakha and the sharia should be achievable. So what does it mean for us to interpret and to create an achievable law? Okay, so we can get to my next slide. I apologize. My There we go. Okay. So I think this really brings us to the question of how does religious law maintain relevancy within changed circumstances? I think one of the main ways that we see this being accomplished both within Islamic and Jewish law is diversity of opinion. That there is this recognition that if we are trying to truly understand what the divine, what God wants out of us, well, we might reach different conclusions. And that as long as we are all sort of bringing sincerity into this endeavor and shared methodology that is agreed upon to this endeavor, well, then we might reach different conclusions as to what the law is, and both of those conclusions might be right. And I think this is something that, at least as an American legal scholar, I see really lacking in our American legal system. I think there's like a real struggle with this idea that, okay, if we bring sincerity and shared methodology and knowledge, right, we have scholars doing this, we might reach different conclusions and both of them could be right. Uh, and we see legal debates and accommodations as a reflection of these different understandings. So these different understandings can create flexibility within the law. And that likewise, context matters. That if we are, if you are Jewish or Muslim and you're going to a legal scholar for an opinion, well, that opinion can be specific to you, right? It can be specific to your individual circumstances and what's going on.
I write about this a lot in my most recent piece. Um, I have a piece forthcoming um, on abortion in Jewish and Islamic law. And I think it's, uh, I mean, it's, I don't want to say like, I love abortion. It's sort of, I love the study of it. And part of the reason I love the study of it is because you see the ways in which this diversity of opinion really plays out and helps facilitate people make difficult, making difficult decisions in their lives. So the question I then have is, what is the impact on law of religious peoples living in either minority or majority contexts? And part of what we see is what I call institutional legal pluralism, just meaning that there's different options to having law applied to you. So within the context of the United States, this looks like religious arbitration. So religious arbitration where you are going through arbitration and the arbiters are typically people who are applying your own religious law to you. Um, and that those judgments are then enforceable via civil court. So civil courts aren't going to review the judgments other than to make sure they comply uh, with the Arbitration Act, but that you can, in fact, within civil matters, so certainly not in criminal matters, but within civil matters, um, have Jewish or Islamic law applied to you if you so choose to do so under contract. Within the context of Israel, we have religious courts. Um, there is state involvement, so that state involvement happens via the appointment of judges and also um, appeals to the Supreme Court. So we've got sort of two very different systems going on that I, I like to, to look at both and study. So um, the first context I'll look at is what Jewish and Islamic law in terms of institutions look like within Israel. So a big the court systems are an inherited feature from the Ottoman Empire, uh, which a lot of people aren't familiar with and I find really fascinating. So under the Ottoman Empire, you had what was called the Millet system. And under the Millet system, different religious groups had their own courts and they had their ability to apply their own religious law to their own peoples. Now, if you were had a sort of Muslim Jewish conflict that would typically then go under the Ottoman Sharia courts. But if you had a conflict between two to Jews, for instance, then they would go to a Jewish court. Um, there was another, a number of other features um, of the Millet system, including taxation. So different religious communities had the ability um, to collect taxes within their own communities and then distribute them among themselves. So not necessarily going to the state, but for their own communal autonomy. And so these courts were one of the sort of features of having communal autonomy at the time. Now, Part of this depended on who the sultan was. So there certainly were periods of time that were better and there were certainly periods of time uh, that were worse. And so under the British mandate and the eventual creation of the state of Israel, uh, this idea that at least for some matters, different religious communities might be able to have their own courts to resolve certain um, intra-religious conflicts was maintained. And it was maintained until modern day. They still exist. They operate. Uh, for the most part, they have had more limited jurisdiction. So what we see today is that they are mostly focused on family law. So we see a lot of divorce, for instance. Um, and one of the things that's a bit surprising is that when we look at Jewish courts in Israel, when we look at the rabbinic courts, they actually have less flexibility than we might find um, in the Beth Din of America. So particularly in terms of diversity of Jewish legal opinions. So um, while we might uh, have conservative, right? Um, Beth Din in the United States, within Israel, if we're talking about the formal court system of the state, not so much. Muslim courts, on the other hand, um, have much more flexibility than we might find in a lot of Muslim majority con countries. Uh, and the Sharia courts um, of Israel tend to adopt rulings from all four major Sunni schools of thought, um, which I just find is an interesting observation, again, in terms of minority majority context. Of course, this has a lot to do with different uh, political parties and the history of the ways in which coalitions um, have emerged. So there's a very lot of complex history here, um, but it is interesting. And I think that they're that in the United States, at least um, there in terms of Jewish courts, in terms of Beth Den, we see actually like quite a bit more flexibility here. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to highlight, which again, in terms of the ways in which these two communities interact from a legal perspective that I find interesting, 
um, is the ways in which uh, women have been incorporated or not incorporated into the courts. And so let me see if I can change my screen share. I already have it open. Yeah, I do already have it open. So let me hang on. So stop this share and switch it so that you can see. I think I switched it. So this is an article from 2017. And um, in 2017, there was a shift in the Israeli Sharia court system that allowed for women to be judges. In some Muslim majority countries, um, such as Morocco, women had already been serving as judges since the for a long time, but um, they had not been in Israel. And so there was a big um, push uh, to include women as judges within the formal court system of the Sharia court of Israel. And um, here, right, we see uh, the justice minister helping install the first ever female qadi or judge for the uh, Israeli Sharia court system. And so Hannah Mansour Khatib, right, was appointed. And this was met with a lot of resistance from particular uh, Jewish communities in Israel. And part of the reason why this was met with a lot of resistance was there was a concern uh, that if the Sharia court was seen making these accommodations and now having, there's now multiple women that have served in this capacity, that there would be similar pressures on the rabbinic courts to do the same. Uh, and so it, it was sort of interesting in that you didn't actually see a lot of resistance within the Muslim communities in Israel against this, but rather um, particular Jewish communities within Israel out of a concern of what it would then put pressures on them, how other Jews would see this and then desire um, changes within their own rabbinic legal system. And so this is from 20, so this is from 2017. Let me share my screen again. So as of January of this year, um, the high, one of the high courts in Israel ruled that women can fill rabbi slots in the chief rabbinate's top body. So not exactly the same in terms of fulfilling um, the same roles as is in the Sharia court, uh, but we see that women now may serve on the top council of the chief rabbinate. Um, and as rabbis on the assembly that elects Israel's chief rabbis, um, and this was a ruling from the High Court of Justice. So we do see, which I think is interesting, maybe that some of their um, concerns that there would be pressures for more incorporation of Jewish women um, into the rabbinate certainly um, has come to pass. And it seems like at least in part, uh, this there's a lot of different reasons why this was able to come about, but at least in part, was from the shift that happened within the Sharia court. Let me share my PowerPoint again. So uh, what about Jewish and Islamic law in the United States, where we're located? So um, this is primarily done through arbitration, right? S such as the Bethlehem of America, and um, we have a number of different Islamic um, arbitration tribunals emerging as well. They are certainly less developed than we see within the Jewish community. And we've certainly seen a lot of um, Muslims looking to the example of what the Jewish community has done historically in developing arbitration, religious arbitration in the United States. And how have these developed? So um, the respective legal traditions have developed these arbitral bodies um, in a way that ensures that they meet the procedural, so not, there's no substantive requirements, procedural requirements of the American Arbitration Act, so the Federal Arbitration Act. And um, we see these different sort of incorporations of the requirements of these procedural requirements, things like the ability to appeal. Don't historically really exist within Jewish and Islamic law, but it is required under the FAA. Um, we start to see certain rules of evidence. Um, we see certain rules of, of allowing an attorney in uh, that are being accommodated in order to meet the requirements of federal law.
And so I think there's like an interesting question here of whether or not procedure itself, sort of, sort of like the requirements of running some sort of tribunal, um, is inherently religious or secular. Uh, and I don't think this question even particularly makes sense historically because the division we have between sort of religious and secular procedure didn't really exist. It's, it's very much a, a modern question. And I think that uh, most scholars have sort of come down that it's okay to meet these procedural requirements, that we can make it work within the legal uh, religious traditions. And I think that these arbitral bodies really serve a specific need within the American context, um, a sort of specific problem with just taking your uh, issues to civil court. I mean, one certainly being a some uh, religious beliefs that it is required for you to resolve disputes among co-religionists uh, before folks who can actually apply your religious law to you, not necessarily just going uh, to non-Jews or non-Muslims to resolve intercommunity re disputes. Uh, but there's also the issue that American civil courts don't really know how to apply Jewish or Islamic law. And these civil courts often take a positivistic view of religious law, right? They say, oh, Jewish law says X or Islamic law says X, rather than really acknowledging the plurality and diversity of opinion that exists within each respective legal tradition. Um, additionally, civil courts may have Islamophobic or anti-Semitic understandings of religious law. And certainly when we look at the history of Islamic and Jewish law within civil courts, we definitely can find instances of both Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. So what about choice? So Jews and Muslims living in the United States today can choose to what extent they will apply religious law in their lives. Today, while we certainly may still have social pressures of community or family, um, when and how Muslims and Jews seek the ruling of religious courts may differ. And so one of the sort of liberties that we have is that we can choose which forms we want. Uh, and I think there's these really interesting questions of legal authority. These are just to give you an example of some of the things I like to think through. Um, but does authority or permission originate from the state, right? Or are we looking at the ways in which authority and permission in regards to religious law originates from God? Um, and do religious courts or arbitration view themselves as subordinate to a secular state or as subordinate to God and simply the state is a way in which to facilitate the application of religious law? Likewise, how does appellate review, right, being able to challenge a certain rabbi or scholar's legal opinion um, impact religious change? We see this um, happening actually quite a bit within the Sharia court of Israel, that there is legal memoranda and binding case law being used, um, particularly through appellate review, particularly through these challenges of really saying, hang on, what does religious law actually say here? Um, and then there's also this question of if there is a secular state overviewing religious judges, does that then change how they apply religious law or not, right? Are they immune? Are they able to simply uh, block out the fact that there may be requirements of the state? Um, and then I think that there's interesting questions, particularly for folks living in a minority context, but Right, we as Americans have certain ideas of what our rights are and what needs to be upheld and what happens when those are maybe in conflict uh, or at least tension with religious law. And there's a question I think of to what extent do religious laity put pressure on religious courts to interpret religious law in ways that conform to the liberal state or at least their idea of what their rights ought to be. And I think we see some of this um, in particular in regards to shifts and new interpretations in regards to women's leadership is a prime example of that. And then there's a question of, okay, does sovereignty originate with laity um, in a way that the state does not recognize a religious law and sort of think of as exclusive to a secular or democratic state, right? So to what extent is this understanding of religious law driven by non-religious law experts and how much of it is a conversation with scholars who are then taking into consideration understandings of laity. Uh, and then finally, I have these questions of forum shopping. Uh, and we see this, there's some really interesting work being done by some colleagues of mine. Um, Chaim Simon at Villanova comes to mind. 
of, okay, we're talking about the American context in particular, which is different than Israel, where there are not um, nearly as many options for not going to religious court in certain contexts. But if we're talking about the United States, where you could go to religious arbitration, or you could file in civil court against a co-religionist, does that put any pressures on religious courts to think about what litigants want? What are the outcomes that might happen for a litigant if they go to civil court that wouldn't happen um, within a religious court context? And we see various groups trying to take some of these things into consideration, particularly within the context of divorce. How do you ensure the rights, for instance, of divorcing women? I mean, the rights that they might expect if they were going to civil court, but also wanting to maintain their commitments to their religious law. And then I think likewise, um, to what extent do religious courts respond to concerns about relevancy? And I think this really expands uh, more broadly than even religious courts. This question of for religious leaders more broadly, for religious communities, how do you maintain relevancy in a changing world? And I think especially for those of us who are in a minority context, how do you maintain relevancy um, and meaning for folks who are living in a context that the majority of folks don't have the same religious commitments, don't have necessarily the same motivations for upholding or obeying law. And this is something that I talk to my students a lot about within law school. So I have you know, law students who are for the most part studying American law and then take either my Islamic law or my Jewish law class. And one of the questions I really pose to them is, what's the difference of following law because you're concerned about the police or concerned about some sort of police arm of the state coming down on you? Uh, and what does it mean to obey and try to uphold law as a means of becoming closer to God? And this is sort of one of the main motivations for me as to why I study this, is I, these sort of this comparative traditions in particular, is I find this question of motivation really interesting. What does it mean to adhere to law as a means of becoming closer to God? Because I think that at least for a lot of Americans, um, it's a different orientation following law I don't think for most Americans it would often occur to them that it is part of their relationship with God, that it is an integral piece of, of living a life that is holy. And so for me, I think thinking about law in that context is one that I find intriguing and exciting. I wanted to make sure I left 15 minutes for questions and comments. I'm proud of myself. I think I've left 16 minutes, so I'm happy to start fielding those. You were very exactly on time. Um, so thank you for that. And um, thank you so much for that really interesting and really informative presentation and um, for taking the time again to be with us. So um, I'm going to just start with kind of a, an easy clarification. Can you just clarify for those of us who don't know what the Beth Din of America is? Oh, sure. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to, to make assumptions. <laughs> um, yeah. So the, the Beth Din um, is an organization. You can actually, let me see if I can. Wait show you their website because they're great so it is a jewish court um for which uh jewish americans can bring forward disputes let me show you their website so that you know what i'm talking about you they're generally considered the did i get the um it... you're Having your full screen. I it's like my full screen. Let me try again. Um, okay, there you there go. go. Uh, so you can see they are generally considered um, the largest uh, Beth Din in the United States. There are different um, ones. So for those of you that are in New York, for instance. So I, I studied Talmud at uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary there in Manhattan. And um, they likewise have a Beth Din, but you can see that there's sort of different services that you can get. Uh, you can look at who you're. So as I mentioned, uh, it's typically done through arbitration, which happens under the Federal Arbitration Act. And so hence why they are, you can see here on their about, it is um, so about Dayanim slash arbitrators, <laughs> because they're serving, uh, at least in the American context, as arbitrators. They also do mediation uh, and they do a variety of things. So they do both um, familial disputes. So things that look like divorce, but uh, likewise, 
they also do commercial disputes and they do pretty sophisticated commercial disputes as well. And I think that, yeah. So I think I mentioned um, Professor Chaim Simon. Uh, he is also one of the arbitrators for the BDA. Um, and he, he primarily specializes, he's a, a friend of mine, uh, primarily specializes in commercial matters. Thank you. Um, and thank you for clarifying that for us. We appreciate it. Certainly. I apologize if, I, if there's any needs, any other clarification I've had. Sometimes I get in law school for professor mode and I forget that we don't all have the same shared language around these things. No worries. All good. Um, so you mentioned Maimonides um, earlier. So uh, if I, and if I'm remembering correctly, he wrote the mission Mishnah Torah. Um, so is there anything similar to the Mishnah Torah in Islamic law in terms of like codification of law? Um, that Yeah. Is there anything yeah, similar? certainly. There, there are similar um, codification endeavors. We see that the codification endeavors um, in Islamic law happened a bit later. Um, so a number mm -hmm. of the codification efforts within Islam, formalized codification efforts in Islamic law happened uh, often in response to colonialism. So for mm -hmm. instance, the French civil code was like a big motivator um, for a lot of the codification efforts that happened at that time. But even prior to that, we do see similar to the Mishnah Torah, sort of like compendiums uh, that Muslims could use as reference who didn't, uh, we see that one of the earliest ones, like, do I have it next to me? It's like, I think in my, <laughs> I'm like looking at my, but shall, I must have moved it into my other, I must have moved it into my campus office. Anyway, uh, the Mawatta of um, uh, Imam Malik is, is a really, really early one, very early Islamic law, where he sort of like puts together sort of a codification of what he thinks Islamic law is. And then you can go into his larger works that have very long descriptions. Thank you. Um, so one of the questions that you kind of posed at the end of your presentation was the sort of question of relevancy of religious courts. So do you see religious courts trying to answer that, like how we stay relevant? And if so, um, how? I, I think we do see some of that. Uh, and, and I think in a number of different capacities. So, mm -hmm. you know, and I think we see that both in terms of courts and then also just in terms of responsum. So in terms of issued um, opinions, I think that one of my, I teach this in my Jewish law course, um, and I think my, one of my favorite examples of this has to do with actually same-sex marriage. And mm -hmm. so I, I sort of have my students read um, quite historic and, and, and older um, opinions on prohibitions against same-sex relationships. Uh, and but even within, for instance, the Orthodox community, we see that like there's these pieces from the 1950s that are, are what you might expect from the 1950s, really, of any community talking about same sex relationships. Um, but then we see this shift happen in the 1990s to early 2000s, where same sex relationships are certainly not allowed. Um, but there are these specific rulings that come out that say, but but they should, someone in a same-sex relationship, even if it's public, should still be welcomed into the synagogue, can still take part of prayer, which is a major, actually a major, major issue, and that their children are still, can be members. So mm -hmm. we see this shift happening. And then likewise, within the conservative community, um, we see responsum. Um, the responsum are really fascinating because they wasn't actually able to reach a consensus, uh, but we see mm -hmm. As all of the opinions are considered to be authoritative, so you can adopt any of the opinions, um, and some of those opinions do allow for same-sex marriage and for same-sex marriage to be ordained by a conservative rabbi. And so we see, again, I think this is certainly in, uh, I don't know the reaction to, but at least in consideration of some of the changed ideas and understandings of same-sex relationships in the United States. Thank you. Um, and so uh, another question that came in um, that I'm going to combine with a couple of questions that are sort of on a similar wavelength. Um, so do you ever come across sort of contradictions between religious law and, um, you know, American secular law? Um, and how, you know, how do these religious laws and, um, you know, the sort of secular American courts uh, deal with those contradictions? Yeah, I would say, um, yes, for sure, these contradictions exist. They exist both within the courts and outside of the courts. So, you know, I think uh, it, it, easy, maybe not easy, easy, but example actually is in the question of the abortion debate. 
right? Because mm -hmm. even if we look at the, the most restrictive opinion, and there's a wide diversity of opinion on the permissibility of abortion within Jewish and Islamic law, if we go with even the most restrictive opinions, it is not simply allowed for a woman to get an abortion if her life is endangered. It's actually mm -hmm. religiously required of her. And that, that is, I mean, we see this coming up in a bunch of different places, but that's intention um, with the state laws, at least of an, a number of states um, today. Uh, and so I, I, that's a very easy um, example. I think that we see other examples, for instance, of in divorce. So there's a pretty famous case within Islamic law that I've, that I've spoken about before, where uh, Islamic law, similar to Jewish law, marriage is done by contract. So a ketubah or a kitab, it's, it's a contractual mm -hmm. relationship. And within Islamic law, women can have what's called a deferred dower, mm -hmm. meaning that if their husbands divorce them, then the contract calls for them to be paid a certain amount of money. And mm -hmm. so there was a Muslim marriage contract that called for the woman to be paid, I think it's three hundred dollars or $500,000 in the event that her husband divorced her. And mm -hmm. uh, the American Civil Court simply would not uphold it. Uh, mm -hmm. There was both tension in terms of how an American Civil Court understood marriage and divorce and the types mm -hmm. of um, monies that one might be entitled to in terms of support after a divorce. And they said that it was for the length of marriage. They'd been married for two years. I think they said, no, no American civil court would ever grant this much after two years of marriage. Uh, and then also they clearly did not understand Islamic law uh, because they seemed very confused about whether she owed the money or he owed the money. Um, and any scholar of Islamic law reading their contract, it was very clear that he owed the money upon divorcing her. Um, thank you so much. And um, I think you might have talked about this at the beginning of your presentation, but forgive me if I'm misremembering. But um, this question is, Jewish law has a long tradition of arbitration. And is there a similar uh, tradition in Islamic law? So there certainly is a similar tradition in Islamic law in terms of informal dispute resolution. So mm -hmm. For instance, like there's verses in the Quran about if a couple are disputing and thinking about divorce, that they should go, he should have someone, she should have someone, then they should go and meet with them. So we see things like that uh, happening. In terms of like sort of formalized arbitration through an arbitral body, uh, like through the Federal Arbitration Act, within the United States, definitely newer within the Muslim community. Muslims generally, in terms of numbers, are a bit newer in the United States. We do see uh, more development within the UK, although again, um, the Jewish community has, a, I mean, especially especially in England, uh, a much longer standing history of arbitration within the UK. Thank you. Um, and I think this is just another uh, kind of clarifying question. Um, if, well, so you talked a bit about how um, religious arbitration is somewhat part of civil courts in the United States. Um, so did, uh, the American Arbitration Act, um, like, sort of include that when it was created, or have religious courts then changed in um, relationship to the American Arbitration no, Act? No, so, so it's certainly a part of the Arbitration Act itself that there is civil court review, but the civil mm -hmm. court review is and always has been that you have met the procedural requirements of the act. Uh, so that means like, you know, in terms of like notice given to parties, selection of arbiters, things along those lines that you met sort of the requirements of whatever it tells you about how it should operate. But the civil court review is not of whether or not you applied the law correctly. So for instance, if you have an arbitration applying Jewish law or an arbitration applying Islamic law, the civil court is never going to look to say, wait, is that what halakha really says? Is that really what the rabbi is not going to do that? Just going to see if you complied with the requirements of like arbiter selection and things along those lines. There, there, it is more complex than that, but that's the basics of it. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so, you know, clearly for this presentation um, specifically, but I think for your research more generally, you clearly have to deal with a lot of different sources and um, lots of different things. So can you just talk a little bit about your research process and kind of how you you deal with all those different different things? 
Sure, it is definitely a lot. And while there are a lot of similarities, it's not always apples to apples. Sometimes it's apples to oranges and there's limitations to the comparative project itself. Um, typically though, in terms of like what I do, I usually start with people who I think are smarter than me. Some people who at least mm -hmm. have studied things a lot longer than me as somebody, I recognize I'm a junior scholar. Uh, and so I usually um, will start with the work of people who are my contemporaries, whose work I admire and who I think other people admire and people recognize as authoritative. And I usually will go and start with their work. And then mm -hmm. I do what I call citation mining. And so mm -hmm. I will see who they were referencing and I will go and pull those works. And then sometimes I keep sort of going down the rabbit hole of citation mining. Um, and I usually, uh, almost always, while I will start with what are called like secondary source materials, mm -hmm. if for instance, they're making a reference to the Torah or a part of the Talmud or things along those lines, I will then also go pull those texts myself and then also, myself, and then also see who else has interpreted them and maybe interpreted them in different ways ways. Uh, I would say the hardest part uh, for me probably is working through multiple languages. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes when I try to work in Arabic and Hebrew, like much less also Aramaic, uh, my brain gets, you know, it can be stuff to make those switches. And so sometimes what I will do is I'll rely on translations and then I will go back and double check that I think the translations have been done correctly. Uh, well, that sounds like a lot, but thank you for doing the work. Um, so we are kind of coming to the end of our time, um, and I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to everybody's questions. Um, we had a lot of them, so we appreciate you all being here. But I do want to um, ask one last one, which is um, if people want to learn more about this topic and your research, what should they be? What should they be reading? Do you have any recommendations? Oh, that's a really wonderful question. Um, I am working on a website, so I will say that. Um, my post-tenure project, God willing, uh, still working on the tenure, but hopefully in a year or two, is to create um, sort of more accessible pieces. I think even this, I'm like sometimes conscious that I write in too much legalese, and so wanting to write pieces that you don't have to have gone to law school to understand. Uh, I would also say the work of Michael Broid at Emory, and I can put, uh, I can show you his picture real quickly. He's done um, some really wonderful comparative work. Uh, so let me share that screen real quickly. He is also a friend. And then the other thing I would recommend is Anver Eman's book. Um, I am forgetting the exact title. Here it is. I'll show you the Amazon page. This is a great book. Um, so Andre Eman is a scholar at the University of Toronto, also a friend, um, Islamic and Jewish Legal Reasoning, Encountering Our Legal Other. So this is a really fabulous book. And I, you can get it. It's, unlike most academic writing, um, it is relatively <laughs> affordable. <laughs> so you can get it for less than 20 bucks. Amazing. And I put both of those in. Uh, names in the chat so um for those of you who uh want to see it again you can see it right there yeah and michael uh, has a great book on um arbitration which oh. i can really quickly pull up as well so and he also covers christianity um and mm. he's part of the center for the study of law and religion at emory uh, but you can, this one, unfortunately, you might want to get from the library because I don't think it is, uh, it is typical oh, yeah. academic publications of being quite a bit of money, um, but Sharia Tribunals, Rabbinic Courts, and Christian Panels, Religious Arbitration in America and the West. Okay, and I put that also in the chat. Um, well, thank you so much, Professor Ben Halim, for being with us this evening and for, for answering all those questions and for putting together a really informative presentation for us. Um, I really appreciate it. And I know our audience does as well. Um, and I want to thank uh, all of you who joined us today out there in the internet verse. Um, and if you enjoy today's program, we hope you'll consider making a donation to support the museum at mjhnyc.org slash support. And also joining us for our upcoming programs, which you can find at mjhnyc.org slash current events. 